2023 was a crazy year for the U.S. housing market. We saw interest rates continue to climb. Home prices kind of came down. But most of all, we saw a lot of potential home buyers leave the market simply due to affordability and some left just simply due to fear. Well, fortunately for them, at the most recent Fed's meeting, the Federal Reserve announced that they were going to relax on any rate hikes through the end of this year. Well, that has brought excitement from many potential home buyers, making them have more interest in the possibilities of finally being able to achieve home ownership. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about five key areas, how to better understand the market, what your income needs to look like for you to be able to qualify, what your credit and debt situation must be, how much money you need to have saved, and also how to find find, structure, and negotiate the perfect deal for you to win in 2024. Before I jump in, me and my team get calls every day from veterans who are simply trying to navigate the VA loan process. So if you find yourself stuck and you want to get some guidance from a team of individuals who specialize in helping veterans walk through this process, give us a call, shoot us a text. We're happy to help. All right, so let's talk about the market a little bit. A lot of people are always trying to time the market, but what ends up happening is they end up taking no action simply because they miss out on the opportunity that they would have had from appreciation and equity gained over the time that they had owned a property to begin with. You see, in May of 2022, the median home price peaked at 430,000. Well, 18 months later today, the median home price is at 412,000, a 5% decrease. Some people would look at this and say, if you bought a house, prior to that point, you lost money. And I did. I bought a house two months before May of 2022. And that property did see a slight dip. But did I lose money? No, because I still own the home today. You see, when you buy real estate, you build wealth over the time that you own it. As time goes on, the property goes up in value and the debt that is associated with the property goes down, thus creating equity for you. You see, I still own that property today and it is making me passive income for me and my family's overall long-term wealth. But let's talk about what caused the decline to happen in the beginning. You see, in 2022, we started seeing rapid inclines in inflation, which caused interest rates to spike. It caused a lot of economic uncertainty and global unrest started happening during that time as well. A lot of variables caused a lot of fear in financial markets across the board, which caused a lot of people to pull back on a lot of financial activity. But one thing that you didn't see happen in that period or since this period has started is you didn't see a crash. The infamous word that everyone has been expecting and some have unfortunately been hoping for. You see, real estate is a safe investment because it's far more than just simply putting money in to like the stock market. Real estate provides shelter. It provides a place of peace, home, safety. It provides something to families that's far more than just something that changes your bank account balance. That's what keeps real estate strong. The difference between real estate today in 2023 and now coming up on 2024 and 2008 is the fact that 2008 was caused primarily from subprime or predatory lending. You see, during those periods, many people were put into bad loans that ended up hurting them financially. And a lot of them were put into those situations to no fault of their own. It was done to them by mortgage lenders, banks, and companies that had inflicted a lot of this pain that home buyers felt. Thus, over time, a lot of default or missed payments, foreclosures, short sales, bankruptcies started to happen. And this ended up causing what we know as the big short or the bubble to burst. Well, today in 2024, we don't see a wide range of foreclosures, short sales and bankruptcies. We actually see some of the lowest numbers that we have seen in decades, we still do see high demand with low supply. And when you couple low default rates, high demand and low supply, what you end up having is a very stable real estate market. That's part why we have only seen a 5% decline, but it has tapered off and plateaued since that point and is trending upwards going into the new year. You see, at the end of 2022, a lot of institutions and hedge funds announced that they were going to start investing in more real estate themselves. This would be the JP Morgan Chases of the world, the Black Rocks and the Black Stones that we all hear about that own almost everything that is near and dear to our livelihoods. Well, they did not disappoint. What they ended up doing in 2023 was purchasing more and more single family homes to add to their portfolio, thus turning us eventually into a renter nation 
at the rate that they're going. Now, I'm not saying that to fear anyone or make them scared of the market in any form or fashion, but just do some research on that. You'll find that exactly what I'm saying with these particular institutions to be very true, which means that the only way we are going to be able to combat this is if we purchase our own property for ourselves, for our own portfolios and long-term wealth. So now that you know this, you're probably wondering, how do I take advantage in 2024? Well, before we do anything else, we need to get some things in order. The first thing we need to talk about is your income. When it comes to your income and trying to qualify with the VA home loan benefit, they're going to use your gross income. And this is the money that you have coming in before taxes are taken out. The different forms of income that you could have could be from VA disability, social security, or SSDI. It could come from a pension. It can come from retirement, or it can come from a form of employment like hourly salary or active duty military as other different forms as well. When it comes to your hourly and salary forms of wages, what they're going to look for is that you have been working in that line of work for two years. Now, it doesn't mean that you have been with the same employer or even the same type of employer. What they're looking for is the same type of work that you're doing. Here's an example. Let's say you're a receptionist at a law office and then you go from being a receptionist at a law office to a receptionist at a gym. Well, you're still a receptionist. Those two jobs can translate together, even though the two industries that you're working in are different. That's what they're looking for in those circumstances. Another thing that you can use as previous employment history can actually be from college or trade school. Let's say that you're now working as a registered nurse and you've only been a registered nurse for 30 days. Well, if it took you two years to get your degree in order for you to do your job, that time frame of the time you spent in school actually counts as prior employment history, which means that you technically do not need to wait to buy a home until you've been on a job for two years if you are coming out of college or coming out of a form of trade school. I've seen people do it literally within the month out of school and be able to achieve home ownership. Now, another form that I have not talked about is going to be commission income. And where this really goes into commission, uh, bonus or overtime income, those different forms of income fluctuate, which means that when you are using any of those forms of income, it is going to be required that you have been receiving that income for at least two years. The reason for that is because of, as I mentioned, the fluctuation in the income across different periods. And what they're going to need to do is take a average across the two years to determine what your qualifying income would be. Now, if you are an hourly employee and you're also receiving a overtime as well or a bonus, but it hasn't been two years, it doesn't mean your hourly employment or your hourly income doesn't count. It just means that they're not going to use the bonus or overtime income as a additional income. The only way those that additional income can count is if you've been receiving it for at least two years. Now, if you are self-employed, this is a little bit unique. Self-employed, again, is also going to be a two-year average, but they're going to be using the tax returns. Because you are self-employed, you have a lot of different tax benefits that go on with your situation, which means that your lender is going to need to review your tax returns to come up with that two-year average. So if you are being very aggressive with write-offs and taking advantage of, unfortunately, all of the perks that come with being a business owner, owner, well, it's also going to probably bite you in the butt too, because it's going to make it look like you're not making much money. So the way I would say around this or to work through this is to have a good VA loan specialist and also your CPA working together to find the happy medium in regards to what write-offs you can use to still allow you to have enough income showing in your situation to allow you to qualify for a home. The next thing we need to talk about is going to be credit. When it comes to credit, the VA's requirement is actually that there is no minimum credit score. Kind of crazy, right? But don't write that down. You see, the VA is not the one who actually does loans. It's lenders who do loans. The VA just guarantees and determines who's eligible, which means that you need to know what is the minimum credit score that you need to have with the lender that you're working with. Most of them require 620. Some will require as low as 580 and very few will allow you to have less than that. 
But do you think if you had a 600 credit score and you're working with somebody that requires 620, they're going to tell you that the guy down the street will allow 580? Probably not. So know what your credit score requirement is with the lender you're working with if you find yourself in that lower tier of the credit spectrum. The different credit bureaus that are out there to determine your credit scores are going to be Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. When applying for a mortgage, they're going to pull all three for every borrower. If it's just you on the loan, they're going to pull those three and throw out whichever is the higher score, whichever is the lower score, and they're going to use whichever one falls right in the middle. The middle one could be different for everyone. If if there's two people or multiple people on the loan, they're going to do the same thing. And then whoever has the lower of the two middle scores is going to be the score that is used to determine qualification. Some of the ways that you can check your scores for free are going to be apps like Credit Karma, Credit Sesame, Credit Wise, and even the Experian app. Keep in mind though, these use a very unique scoring model or system that isn't going to be the same system that's used for when you pull for a mortgage. What I would tell you to do is as a good general rule of thumb, whatever score you see pop up on those apps, automatically subtract 30 points to give yourself a safe buffer as to where you'll probably be when you apply for a mortgage. So if you see your score on there showing up at 700, you're more than likely going to be right around the 670 range when you do apply for a mortgage. And that's simply just due to the scoring model. Now, these apps still do have value, even though it's not going to be the most accurate score. You see, these apps still provide you with the ability to keep up with your activity. What's going on with credit inquiries? Were there any recent inquiries? that you could possibly dispute. Or if you're sitting at work one day just eating lunch and you suddenly get a notification from Credit Karma saying that you have a brand new inquiry that you know you obviously didn't do, well, now you can take action and dispute that versus just sitting back with nothing on your side to keep you in the loop of what's going on with your credit. When it comes to the liabilities part of your credit, this is going to be the other aspect that they're looking for on your credit other than the score. This could be for things like a auto loan, a credit card, student loans, personal loans collections, charge-offs, really anything that is going to have a balance and a payment. But it's not the balance that determines your ability to qualify. It's actually going to be your overall minimum payment across all of your monthly liabilities. The reason for this is because they're using the monthly income that you have and the monthly minimum payments for all your liabilities to determine what your qualifying standards look like. So if you have higher balances or even a large amount of student debt, the total balance is not what's going to be used against you to determine what your options are. It's going to be really what the payments are. And I've seen many people still be able to qualify with a high balance in credit or high balance in student loans, but because they have a manageable payment with their student loans, they've still been able to achieve homeownership. What are some ways that we could increase our scores if we find ourselves in a little bit more of a lower spectrum? Well, one way is to limit the amount of times you get your credit pulled. Try not to just take advantage of every promo that you get in the mail or every time you walk into a store and they offer you to apply for their credit card to get 10% off. You see, these excessive increase is what starts to make your credit profile look like what's known as desperate for credit, which essentially causes your scores to come down due to the large amount of increase. If you are not in a position to have a need for that credit line, do not get it pulled. This is going to over time only make your credit profile look better and look like a less desperation situation. The other thing that you want to do is try to manage your balances. If you have a credit line that has a limit of $1,000, ideally you want to keep it below 30% of that, which would be $300. This is going to allow you to be in a better overall situation when it comes to qualifying and also when it comes to your credit because it is not going to have a drastic effect on your scores as it would if you had a $1,000 trade line and it was completely maxed out. Another thing that you wanna do is just obviously make sure you're paying your bills on time. This is a very huge one that I hope I don't need to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Pay your bill on time. I get it. Things happen. I've had things happen in my life. I am not perfect. And anyone telling you they are is definitely lying to you right then and there. Things happen, but you can rebound. So if you're in a position to make the minimum payment, just make the payment. Help your credit score. 
by just making the payment, even if that score is maxed out. It is far better to just make the minimum payment than to just wait until you have all the money to pay it off. Another thing that you don't want to do is just open new trade lines. As I mentioned earlier, when it comes to increase, if you are not in a position to where you need a new trade line, don't take it out. The other thing that you want to try to do is keep in mind that new trade lines don't necessarily help your scores. A lot of people think that after paying off all their debt, they're now in a position to where they should take out a new credit card to help them. And that's not true. You see, whenever you add a new trade line, for example, a credit card to your credit, it actually takes six payment cycles to determine how you are as a borrower with that entity before it actually does anything positive, which means that when you add a new trade line, it actually pulls your scores down slightly and it stays there until you actually have those six payments. But a good hack, if you're really in a position to really need to boost your scores is to use what's called an authorized user. An authorized user is anytime someone adds you to their credit card, let's say they have an American Express card, and what happens is you now inherit all of the history for that trade line. I had a client whose mom had a Discover card that was 25 years old. He was only 20 years old. So when I pulled his credit, it showed that he had a Discover card on his credit that was older than he was. And it had inflated his score so much that he had an 800 credit score. And this was simply because his mom had a credit card that she added him to that was very seasoned, had very positive reporting history, and she was doing a very good job at managing the balance. These three things are very important. You don't wanna become an authorized user on someone's credit that, or someone's credit card that they just got. Ideally, you want it to be something that is older than at least two to three years with positive payment history, and they are being very, very focused on managing that balance. The other thing is if you do get added as an authorized user or you already are an authorized user, user and that person has started to be a little bit more irresponsible with that trade line, you can actually just get it removed and deleted completely free and it's pretty much immediate. You just have to reach out to that creditor and they will actually delete it from your credit, all the history on that trade line if you are just an authorized user to it. Before I jump into our next point, if you've gotten value from this video so far, do me a huge favor and hit that like button down below. This simply tells YouTube algorithm that you have found this content valuable and will allow it to be pushed out to more veterans just like yourself. And if you wanna stay up to date on all the things that veterans need to know on the VA Home Loan Benefit, I challenge you to subscribe to the channel and join our community. The next thing we need to talk about is assets and savings. Sure, the VA loan has a no down payment requirement, but what often gets misunderstood is closing costs. Closing costs are a completely separate different thing. This is gonna be for things like title and escrow fees. Title and escrow could be coming from your taxes, insurance, title report, title insurance, and other items that are just there to protect your overall investment in your home purchase. The other part of it all, other than title and escrow fees though, is going to be lender fees. Some lenders do charge you to work with them and they charge you through your closing process. And this could be for things like simply your loan application, processing, underwriting, loan origination, and even credit report fees. Some lenders do not charge fees, but others do. It's important though, regardless of who you're working with, to understand and know what fees are associated with the lender that you're working with before you get too deep into the process. And you can just simply ask that question upfront when you have your initial conversation. Closing costs for title and escrow fees are going to run you at about 2% of your loan amount. So if you're buying a $400,000 house, your closing costs are going to be roughly $8,000. But remember, if you are also working with a lender who charges fees, those items will end up just simply being added on top of that. So are you saying this means you need to have $8,000 saved? No, well, yes and no. You see, it's all about how you structure a deal, which we're gonna talk about next. All right, so let's recap. We talked about the market, we talked about income, we talked about your credit and liabilities, and we talked about your assets and savings. Well. Now we need to find the right deal. And the best way to do it is going to be finding motivated sellers. 
Motivated sellers could be coming from age listings, people who have experienced financial hardship, divorce, relocating, even new home builders are known as motivated sellers. And also iBuyer companies like Open Door and OfferPad, which were entities who purchased properties from home sellers at an inflated amount. And then the market correction has caused them to be in a position to where they're now struggling to offload some of these deals. These deals have created a major opportunity for veterans to negotiate a ton of credit. You see, seller credit can be anything from the seller that can be used towards your closing costs and even in some cases used to pay off some of your debt. Your seller can contribute up to 4% of whatever your loan amount is towards paying off your debt. Now, why would you want that to happen? Well, in some cases, there could be a monthly liability on your credit that's keeping you from qualifying for the amount of home that you want, which means that we need to get that monthly liability completely paid off by paying off that total balance. In some cases, I have seen where we're able to get enough credit from the seller to pay off that overall total balance, allowing you to qualify now for the home that you really wanted. Other cases could be using the credit to pay down or buy down your interest rate. It could be used to pay off your closing costs. I've even been seeing it used to pay off a multitude of things all at once. It really just comes down to how much credit we're able to get and how we're able to properly structure it to make your deal make the most sense. When you're negotiating a deal, it's very important to not get focused on price. A very big mistake a lot of veterans make is focusing on trying to figure out how to get the price lower. And this ends up actually costing them in the long run because it doesn't actually help them save more money in the long term. Here's an example. Let's say you found a property at 400,000 and you think you can get the seller to drop it to 390,000. That is a $10,000 difference. Did you know that your monthly payment on 390,000 will lower by $70 from that $400,000 amount. But if you did this instead, it's gonna lower a lot more. Instead of asking the seller to drop the price from 400,000 to 390, what we're actually gonna do is tell the seller, we wanna offer 400,000, but we want them to give you $10,000 in credit. That $10,000 can be used to lower your interest rate, thus making your monthly payment $135 a month cheaper. This is almost double from what the first option was. And this is why I say focusing on price could end up actually costing you more in the long run because simply making an offer to get more credit versus simply trying to drop the price could actually help you more financially with your overall monthly payment on your purchase. Seller credit can be used for a multitude of different things. It can be used for closing costs, rate buy down, a temporary buy down, or as I mentioned, paying off some of your debt. So there you have it, your 2024 VA loan guide. If you wanna learn how to have multiple VA loans at the same time, watch this video right here.